Thank you all for joining us for today's I Conversations. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Dr. Fei-Fei Li. Uh, she is the Sequoia Pref Professor of Computer Science at Stanford University and the Denning Co-Director of the Stanford Institute of Human-Centered AI, also known as HAI. Before founding HAI in 2019, she served as the Director of Stanford's AI Lab. She was a VP at Google and Chief Scientist of AI and ML at Google Cloud during her Stanford sabbatical in 2017 through 2018. She is also a co-founder and chairperson of the board of the national nonprofit called AI for All, focusing on training diverse K-12 K through 12 students of underprivileged communities to become tomorrow's AI's leaders. Obviously, we all know that's super important and thank you. Uh, among her many distinctions, she is elected member of the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Medicine, and the Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Dr. Lee also serves, well, Fei Fei, also serves on the 12 uh, person National AI uh, Resource Task Force commissioned by the Congress and White House Official Office of Science and Technology Policy, which is super important for all of us. So thank you. Um, as we go through this event, uh, please feel free to ask questions in the chat function, and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. So let's get started. Uh, Fei-Fei, it's been more than two years since you started the Stanford Institute of Human-Centered AI, or HAI as we, as, as we call it. What's the goal of the Institute, and what have you accomplished so far? Yeah, first of all, Reid, thank you for the invitation. And as always, it's such a pleasure to just have a conversation with you. Um, uh, yes, um, HAI has been uh, uh, two years old, half of which is during the global pandemic. But uh, we have, um, we were born out of a very uh, important mission. We believe that we want to advance AI research, education, outreach, and practice, including policy, to better human conditions, because we believe this is such an important technology. It's one of those revolutionary horizontal technology that will fundamentally change the way uh, business conduct themselves and people live their lives. So we want to be focusing on benevolent uh, usage and purpose of this technology. Uh, so what what have happened? Well, there's a lot. Let me just try to be brief. Since um, our focus of our work is in research, education, and uh, policy, I'll try to briefly introduce uh, each of the three areas. On the research side, we have more than 250 faculty and hundreds of students, researchers involved in uh, all kinds of interdisciplinary cutting edge AI related research. Uh, thanks to our generous friends, we have multiple uh, programs encouraging that kind of uh, from moonshot program uh, projects to um, um, to uh, seed, uh, seed level um, uh, budding ideas that includes AI for drug discovery, AI for you know poverty assessment, AI for future of work, uh, fundamental reinforcement learning algorithms, everything um, you know spanning um, tens of dozens and dozens of disciplines. Um, on the education side, HAI focus on both educating our students as well as the, 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 the community and, and, and the ecosystem. Uh, within Stanford, we, are, uh, we have encouraged and continue to support multiple courses. Uh, some of the courses are really new. For example, technology and ethics has quickly become one of the most popular undergraduate and graduate level classes on campus. We have courses on AI for human well-being and, and uh, um, AI for climate, AI for uh, healthcare, uh, focusing on data and fairness and, and all kinds of uh, education programs. Uh, externally facing, we, we recognize the responsibility of uh, Stanford and, and our, our AI expertise. We particularly recognize the lack of opportunity for uh, getting um, uh, objective information about AI. So we focused on um, 
working with, let's say, policymakers, congressional staffers uh, to to train our uh, nation's policymakers. We also have courses towards business executives, uh, and uh, we we have courses towards reporters and jur journalists, and we'll continue to expand that external education program. Last but not the least, uh, we believe uh, this era of AI and technology is so important that uh, we can provide a platform to work with policy makers at both the national, international, as well as state level. So um, you mentioned earlier, um, I, I'm personally honored to be on a, a task force uh, chartered by the Congress for a national uh, AI research resource, but we are working with uh, multiple federal agencies and, and uh, uh, policymakers on various aspects of uh, AI. So that's a short summary of what HAI is busy doing. <laughs> well, I, and 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 obviously, I'm I'm familiar um, uh, since you know I'm kind of chairing your advisory board with the the breadth. So we're trying to get it for everyone who is who is who is joining us to get some understanding, but. What they should have heard already from your from your description is how much HAI is saying we have this focus on what is good for humanity, and then how do we build lots of important bridges? You know, bridges to the policy world, bridges to the research and academic world. Um, one of the other important bridges, which which I think will be particularly useful to this audience, is what's the role of the institute with respect to industry? What are the what are the kind of the interactions and the and the, and the um, uh, and the the kind of the thing that in, uh, industrialists or technologists or the industry should look at HAI and think. Yeah, Reid, great question. First of all, let's just recognize in the AI age that industry is one of the most vibrant and fertile ground for both AI innovative AI applications as well as cutting edge AI research, right? So, so it's it's such an important part of the ecosystem. And frankly, I think it's it's such a unique strength of America for the past um, um, decades, if not century. Um, HAI like the entire Stanford community, we fiercely and profoundly believe uh, in our academic freedom and independence. In fact, that value statement is on our very website. Uh, having said that, we also believe in um, a lot of free exchanges and, uh, and uh, ideas and uh, uh, forums for discussions. So from that point of view, uh, HAI is uh, um, actively engaging with industry partners. For example, uh, to begin with, more formally, we have industry partnership as corporate uh, partners uh, and affiliate programs where we can engage in um, research ex uh, exchanges and, and uh, ideas, of course, protected under our academic freedom and, and independence as a, um, a policy. But more than that, uh, we see ourselves at Stanford to be a rare platform where industry partners, um, colleagues, um, civil society, policymakers, researchers of all disciplines can use it as a neutral platform to discuss, debate, and explore ideas of, frankly, some of the toughest toughest issues of AI. Just give you an example. Um, uh, Reed, I know you know this, we geek out on this uh, GAN, Generative Adversarial Network. This is a mouthful of, a, of a, a name for a really exciting neural network technology that can generate images, speeches, texts. Of course, it can be used for creative usages, to for generating training data, these are all great uses. But it's the same technology can be used for deep fake, uh, disinformation. And how do we, how do we um, continue to exploit this technology for better use, but put guardrails? These are tough questions, and it, industry, um, you know, innovators, entrepreneurs are are trying to use this. Uh, but policymakers, civil society. Um, stakeholders are thinking about the guardrails. 
Stanford provided a platform for them to get together and discuss this. Another example is field recognition technology. This is a technology of, uh, compared to many other AI technology to a certain degree of maturity, yet it also can cause a lot of harms from bias to state surveillance. And uh, how do we really grapple with these challenging issues? We provided, we continue to provide um, uh, forums and platforms for industry um, leaders and partners, as well as uh, other stakeholders to, to come together and uh, discuss this. So we are absolutely, we see the value of our uh, ecosystem and uh, industry is a huge player. And we love to continue engaging. Yeah, I think it's actually, uh, as you describe, it's super important for industry because it gives a independent, um, motivated by you know kind of truth and 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 kind of integrity and objectivity that is in the the academic side to build bridges, but also to give good feedback and good ideas, um, you know, into industry. And so it's it's uh, I think it's a uh, you know, too often, especially the technology industry thinks it can kind of just, oh, we're good, we'll just do it alone. It's like, no, 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 this is getting too important. Uh, and part of that uh, too important is that, you know, AI is obviously um, going to redefine um, many of the landscapes of industry um, as, and have therefore have really serious impacts on society. And I think it was your call to arms in a, a New York Times article, uh, and, and, uh, a uh, essay that you, you know, short essay that you published about, um, you know, kind of putting humans at the center of AI. And therefore, the name of the Institute, obviously. Uh, tell us a little about how you define the term and why it was so important to be human centered. Yeah, thank you, um, uh, Reed. Yes. So, I always believe that since the dawn of human civilization, we there's something in our species DNA that we will never stop innovating. We innovate all kinds of tools to better our lives, better our productivity, and, and to, you know, frankly, um, uh, also interact and change our environment. Uh, but these tools are fundamentally part of human creation and part of the the, the, the human fabric. So, so now that we don't call them tools, we tend to call them machines because they're much more sophisticated. Uh, so philosophically, um, I do believe that there's no independent machine values. Machine values reflect and are human values. Uh, AI as um, exciting and, and uh, this technology is, is made by people and it's going to be used for people. So fundamentally, how we create this technology, how we use this technology, how we continue to innovate, but also put the guard, right guardrails is up to us humans doing it for humans. So at the heart of all this, it's all human centered. And that's how I, I see this in the, in the fundamental way. And of course, it I hope it continue to enhance our humanity and capability and uh, impact our human community, human lives, human society in a benevolent and positive way. And as and, and thinking about the human side, let's let's take it a step more personal. Um, what was it in your early career? Uh, that prompted you to focus on the human side of AI. That's a, it's, it's unusual for someone who is as deep in computer science and, and, and engineering and technical excellence as you are. So how, how did, how did, how did you make that turn? Yeah. Well, okay. So Reed, here's a secret. I don't think I, I ever said that. I don't have a computer science degree. My, my, uh, my journey into all this started from physics that, um, I was deeply, deeply, just like you asking those fundamental questions of beginning of the universe. And, and, and what is, you know, the, the smallest, uh, not atom, smallest, the particle or structure of the, the atoms and that, love 
for fundamental questions、uh, led me to、uh, the writings of the 20th century physics giants like Einstein, Schrodinger, Roger Penrose, who just got Nobel Prize, but by the way, last year.、Um, and、uh, I noticed that these. Physicists in the second half of their life start asking a different kind of fundamental question, and it's the question about life, and that led me into a, I guess now it's a lifelong passion towards un,、uh, trying to understand the fundamental questions of life, questions that really capture my imagination. Even early in my early undergraduate was intelligence. What makes、um, what What、um, makes intelligence arose in、uh, animals and especially high intelligence in humans, and so I started my entire journey in intelligence with human intelligence, human neuroscience, human cognitive science. But I guess still, thanks to my physics background,、um, I quickly gravitated to the mathematical principles of what is the underlying.、Um, Mathematical expression of intelligence, and that got me into、uh, computer science. So it was kind of a very long、uh, journey, but along the way, I had an unusual、um, training as well as exposure to human、um, neuroscience, cognitive science, and、uh, one more dimension to the human side of this technology is also a personal journey. I happened to be.、Um, I happen to come from、um, a fairly humble background as an immigrant. I, you know, as a as a、uh, entrepreneur, I opened a dry cleaner shop and、uh, ran it for seven years. I have a parent whose、uh, health condition is fairly、um, fairly weak, so I had a lot of interaction at the as as just a person living a life where I see、um, uh, how. Human lives can be impacted by、uh, incredible technologies, and so this this、uh, duality of、um, the the philosophically intriguing quest for、um, intelligence plus the grounding human life that I、um, I experience on a daily basis continue to point me to the belief that technology. Uh, can be、uh, framed in a human-centered way, science and technology, and、uh, we we can we can seize every opportunity we can to make it human benevolent. Yep, and actually,、um, obviously, the personal side,、um, you know, kind of naturally leads into the starting of kind of some questions around industry,、um, because you know, obviously, you've participated in industry. In multiple ways,、um, not just the、um, you know putting yourself, your school, and supporting your family through dry cleaner, but, but actually, in fact, you know the 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 major、uh, functions at、uh, Google Cloud and others.、Um, so, what are you、uh, personally excited about with the role of industry in AI? And then,、um, you know, kind of which industries、uh, kind of most benefit from applied AI, and then. Um, obviously, the thread of how human-centered AI plays into that. Oh yeah, definitely, Reid. You and I talk about this. I think industry. I'm tremendously excited. <laughs> I, I actually think you know、um, the 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 democratization of this technology, the innovation, and eventually the the human impact of this technology is mostly delivered through. Industry through startups, through uh, uh, companies, through their products and services. There, there is no doubt about it. And、uh, I was very thankful to have that、uh, sabbatical experience at Google and seeing the、um, uh, because at Google Cloud we serve enterprise businesses. We see different、uh, vertical industries, right from、um, healthcare to financial institute. To、um, uh, energy, gas, to to、um, media, to retail, you know, you you transportation, you name it. So so I'm just 
very excited and, and also I'm very, very excited, just like you, of these budding uh, new um, enter entrepreneurial efforts, the startups, because AI is very new. Um, the, 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 the sky is really the limit in terms of how we imagine this technology can, can serve uh, uh, human well-being. And personally, there is definitely one industry that I, I feel deeply, deeply connected to through my research and personal experiences, healthcare. Um, 10 years ago, I, um, I was still directing Stanford's AI lab. And uh, Reed, you remember 10 years ago was really the, the, the Silicon Valley and, and the world is the middle of the excitement for self-driving car because convergence of technology, the sensors, the algorithms uh, is and the hardware, of course, and, and maps technology is leading to this realization transportation and mobility can be reimagined. And during that time, it really dawned on me, perhaps during one of those uh, hospital stays of, of my mom, that I realized that a similar way of uh, using technology can be uh, applied in healthcare industry where one of the major pain points of our patients and clients is all the lack of context of what's happening to the human in the center of this. And that human is the vulnerable patient. You know, my mom is a cardio patient. Doctors constantly want to know how her behavior is, uh, how her heart rate is changing because of the uh, activities and also in the hospitals uh, doctors and nurses worry about uh, worry about um, um, patients fall having accidents pull their IV lines you know all these things is the lack of uh, um, lack of um, uh, knowledge lack of context of uh, uh, patient patient behavior. So I started this program at Stanford with Dr. Arnie Milstein on what we call illuminating the dark space care, the ambient intelligence of healthcare, and start researching on how AI sensors, edge compute, deep learning algorithms of human behaviors can help doctors and, and, and nurses and patients to recover better, detect condi conditions earlier, and keep them safe. And I continue to work on this uh, at, at Stanford, and I continue to feel very excited to start to see that there are startups um, starting to um, get into this space, innovating rapidly um, in this space. And, and uh, I really want to see one day, um, I don't have to worry about my mom if I'm at work or not with her and her health well-being is being um, helped by AI technology. No, indeed. And and actually, this is a, a good place to ask one of the audience questions we've got so far, uh, because obviously, um, uh, you know, the, the huge opportunity in AI for health and how it transforms that industry. Um, but also, you know, one of the, the, the key questions that is frequently asked about AI models is the model safety and reliability. Um, so the question from the audience was uh, sharing uh, HAI's effort on you know model safety and reliability with industry applications. Obviously, it isn't just health. It, there's also, you know, classically people think about this in, you know, the criminal justice system or the financial system, you know, uh, you know, racial and 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 other forms of social equity. Um, but but what, what is HAI doing? Um, and catalyzing with industry on model safety and reliability? That's a great question. Thank you for asking. And, and Reid, I know you care a lot about this. We, we talk a lot about this as well. So, so the word safety is actually um, loaded with different uh, dimensions. Let me try to unpack that a little bit. You mentioned and the, the question mentioned fairness, which was, you know, the, the, the flip side of that is bias is one big chunk of safety. I'll address a little bit. Uh, uh, there is also other aspects, including the robustness of the, the, the technology. How do we 
quantifiably and reliably understand the robustness. There is also the, the trustworthiness, which uh, has a lot to do with transparency and explainability of the, the technology. And then there is also the whole practice of how ethics can be um, you know, incorporated into the design and development. So, so there are several buckets. Uh, let's just start with the fairness and uh, uh, bias. Um, uh, you know, AI as a technology is a system. If you the, the 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 pipeline of the system, starting from defining the problem to curating the data to designing the algorithm to to developing the product to to delivering the service. Along every point of this pipeline, there is opportunity to introduce bias. At the end of the day, a lot of bias, or maybe all of the bias, is rooted in human bias. Our history, our human psychology is, is you know, where the biases start. So I think um, at HAI, you can see our researchers are working on every point of this pipeline bias. We've got researchers, myself included, working on the upstream data bias, you know, how we um, become vigilant and mitigate the bias that's introduced into the data um, and, and how we try to fix that. Um, classic example, we've got researchers showing that in America, um, uh, most of medical AI research data come from three coastal states, Massachusetts, New York, and, and California. Imagine, while this is a good thing we've got medical data to do research, it's also a deeply, deeply biased way of, um, of uh, using data. So we need to be vigilant and mitigate that. Then we get into algorithm that uh, we cannot throw our hands in the air and say, well, the bias come from data, where can I do? For example, historically, let's say, you know, you're, you're linked to LinkedIn, you're looking at job applicants, um, and uh, there are just a lot fewer women in, uh, let's say, computer science discipline historically. But if we throw our hands in the air and say, well, we'll just use whatever historical data to train whatever algorithm, it'll fundamentally be unfair to women of today and women of tomorrow. So our algorithm, you know, whether it's through a different way of looking at objective functions and, and other, you know, um, more uh, technical uh, methods, we need to mitigate that. And then it comes down to, um, um, uh, comes down to decision making inference. There is another whole, you know, uh, bucket of technology that our researchers are exploring. I just use this to to illustrate. Even on the bias side, we have multiple kind of research. Um, uh, one other thing that I'm actually really excited. We call out machine bias. In fact, machines are the best to call out human bias because there's so much human bias in our data. My favorite, for example, was a few years ago, face recognition algorithm called out Hollywood's bias on using male actors a lot more. They have a lot more screen time and talking time than female actors. These kind of mass data analysis and, and, and machines calling out bias is really important. And we continue to do that. And then there is explainability and robustness research. Uh, we have uh, uh, researchers in medical school, in computer science department, in gender studies uh, 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 programs. They are working closely together in in trying to um, uh, in trying to look at these robustness and explainability um, um, technologies. And and of course. Um, there is the whole design process. And Reed, I know you are one of the staunchest uh, supporters that we have, Stanford HAI, have led to an innovative um, research proposal review process called the Ethics and Society Review. That is a step up from the classic uh, human subject review in universities called IRB. But in this, uh, what we call ESR process, HAI funded uh, research needed 
needs to, every one of them, go through an ethics and society review before we um, we provide funding to support this research. And the philosophy behind this is to uh, bake ethics into the design of the of the um, research program, not as an um, afterthought for mitigation. So that was a long answer to this very profound question of, you know, how HAI, our research and our own practice is looking, addressing this issue of safety and trustworthiness. No, no, it's a super important topic. And I'm glad you were comprehensive because it shows how much work HAI is actually doing on this topic. And that's also one of the reasons why, uh, you know, amongst the, the kind of audience questions that have come in uh, so far, it was like, that's really important to get to sooner. I knew you agree. So I was like, okay, let's, let's do that. Um, Absolutely. Let's, let, yeah. Let me, uh, I think it's worth um, double clicking on the ethics and society review. What have been some of the learnings of doing it so far? Because it's actually one of the things that we'd hope would spread throughout not just industry, but also academia and all the rest as, as a, as a, as a, um, as a tool uh, for being more human centered, human value centered in AI. So what, what's been the learning so far? What, what, what kind of things have come out of it? Yeah, great question. So, so Reed, in fact, I, you probably are aware, I'm also aware even companies are now trying to practice ethics review for their products. I think what is, um, in common is everybody recognize the importance, but what is special and I, I, and I, um, take a lot of pride in this is that at Stanford, we have true experts from you know, uh, sociology, ethics, political science, computer science, uh, bioethics, uh, law coming together to form that deeply, deeply knowledgeable panel. And their, their job is to help our researchers, many of them are, are maybe just deeply technical researcher that do not have the training to guide them to think about uh, when they design their project, what are the human ethical societal impact that might come out of this research intended or unintended i'll use a personal example because that's closer to my to my heart is that i talked about our healthcare research in in ai that uses smart sensors to help uh, uh, for example to help monitor if patients are at the risk of falling in, in, a, in a fragile senior's home. And that's a very painful problem in America. More than $40 billion of healthcare uh, money are spent in mitigating um, you know, potential fall for our seniors. And every fall, uh, you know, costs lives, pain, quality of life, but it costs a lot of money. But uh, as we are excited as technologists to think about how computer vision and smart sensors and edge computing can help, um, we were also uh, confronted with the question of privacy, with the question of, you know, uh, legal ramification that we never thought of. What if the, the sensor picked up a um, care abuse cases? Do they can they serve as legal witnesses, we or 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 some other you know uh, uh, adversarial events? We also have not um, thought deeply at the beginning of how to explain what's the interpretability of this technology, especially if uh, for a, a caretaker like an adult child trying to decide for their elderly parents if this technology is good for them. And uh, as we uh, write up our proposal, as we go through this ESR review process, the bioethicists, the legal scholars, um, you know, philo uh, philosophers uh, formed um, um, a panel start to guide us towards how to, uh, how to think about this, for example, one thing I think that came out that was so cool was that the privacy concern pushed our uh, technology further. It pushed us to think about, uh, uh, you know, all kind of secure computing, federated learning, you know, um, more modern encryption. 
And I think, you know, so one, one always fears that guardrail slows down innovation. In many cases, I disagree. I think these kind of human ethical concern pushes our, our technology further. And, um, and one, that's, that's one personal uh, experience in this research. One thing that is really fun we have learned about this process, because we've only um, beta tested this for, for one year, is you know how technologists tend to want to have a more freedom, a, a bigger box to play. In this case, it provided so much value when we did our our survey that engineers and scientists asked for more of ESR to the point the panel is like, oh my God, we need more resources <laughs> to uh, beef up our team. So it's really heartening to see that there is now the mutual recognition. There's no us versus them in this we are all humans. We as technologists want the best for we as the community. And they are asking for more of this. So we were so encouraged to see um, this one year uh, program and uh, we're absolutely doubling down. We're absolutely gonna uh, continue to expand on this. We hope the whole Stanford adopts this uh, uh, program. Well, and, and, and the world more generally. And I think one of the reasons it was that last part, the last two parts of what you're mentioning, where I think part of the thing I was, I knew that you knew and I was trying to elicit because I think it's important for people to realize that sometimes constraints help with innovation and, 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 and constraints, the whole goal of innovation is the right innovation, the right outcome. And so when you say, hey, it's important, ethics is important, it's like, oh, that doesn't slow us down. No, that helps us accelerate towards the right outcomes. Um, is is the is the, the key thing, and then that that actually folks that once they're engaged with it find it productive and useful and yes. energizing, uh, and so this is one of the things that you know industry people can learn as well in this because it's like no no, no this is actually in fact this isn't going to be the oh it's bureaucracy oh it slow me down it's no no it's accelerate you towards the right outcome and then feel you know the mission and the energy uh, in your blood and your heart about where you're going. Um, and that, I think that what you guys have been doing with uh, ASR is important and everyone should know it. That was the reason I doubled down on that question. Thank you, Reed. Um, and, and, so, also, and also, frankly, Reed, I believe that is a business competitive advantage. When you make the more trustworthy um, and safe product and services, you, you're better off in your market. So it, it really is not to slow you down or to put you in a um, you know competitive disadvantage. It's quite the opposite. Yes, exactly. Um, and so you know one of the things obviously that people when they're consulted they're confronted with new technology and you know it's part of what we're seeing in society and concerns around AI and privacy and data and a bunch of other things they worry a lot about the negatives and it's important to pay attention. That's part of the reason why the model safety ESR. <coughs> But one of the things I, I fear is too often lost in this is the amazing upsides. Uh, the, the fact is, no, 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 it doesn't, it, 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 we're playing for greatness. We're playing for something that could make huge differences in society. And it's very important, you know, kind of classic English uh, idiom, uh, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, and so let's return to the kind of AI and healthcare. Um, and, um, and it's one of the areas that you've been personally intensely focused on, in addition to the overall AI, you know, all of AI and industry and policy and all the rest. Talk a little bit about um, the ways that you're seeing that AI can benefit healthcare. Um, what are kind of some of the things that we should be, what is the future we should be accelerating towards? Yeah, I, I mean, Reid, uh, I know we talked a lot about this. Oh my God, healthcare is, in my opinion, the most important industry that can uh, take advantage of AI. And uh, it, it is also so human centered. It's not just human physical well being, it's also human mental well being and human dignity. And, and it, it frankly does excite me to work in an industry where the benevolence is so pronounced and it's the goal of the industry. So, one thing about healthcare that's really a paradoxical read is 
it's actually extremely data rich. So one would think if it's data rich, it's AI rich, but it's not true. It's data rich and insight poor. So, you know, a patient, you can stick the patient into all kinds of, you know, imaging labs and, and all that. And suddenly the result is that your clinicians and, you know, doctors, nurses are overwhelmed, overworked, overcharting, and, you know, spending too much time charting. And yet they cannot, they don't have tools. They don't have opportunities uh, to glean important insights from um from what's going on in the patient so i absolutely see this is a huge area of opportunity is for entrepreneurs and, and startups and, and companies to really focus on not giving our doctors and nurses more overwhelming amount of data but it's really how we deliver critical insights that is timely and and uh, precise and accurate to really help our patients and that's one huge area the other area is absolutely decision support and um and and also just um uh, productivity support our you know i i lived with my mom in hospital systems for 30 years every time i go i see the nurses and doctors overworked they spend um you know an average shift a nurse works 200 plus tasks walks five or four miles per day uh, spend two hours charting and the american nurses burnout rate is outrageous um 33 of our nurses uh, leave the job after two years these are unacceptable um you know the the, the the heart of healthcare is humans caring for humans, yet our clinicians are not spending time with the patients. And uh, anything this technology can do to reduce that burden, to support their work, their productivity at the end of it is their humanity, um, will help our patients. So that's another area of uh, opportunity in healthcare. And of course, uh, drug discovery were just at the beginning. I, uh, you know, uh, read you're you're probably even more on top of this. The past uh, year, um, I think there is a huge heating up of of uh, drug discovery um, investment and uh, startups, and and you know this is big thanks to a lot of these. Um, molecular cellular genetic uh, technology, but they are turning out volumes of data. And now with machine learning, it can help glean the data and, 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 and uh, help discover important drugs. And of course there is, you know, radiology is a classic example of um, machine learning support, um, even public health that the global pandemic has taught us that is extremely uh, there. I think we, we do have a data issue. We need to uh, break the barriers of data. We need to, you know, um, modernize the way public health data is organized and, and, and information can be gleaned. Uh, one thing, Reid, I want to uh, finish by emphasizing um, in this question is this AI as well as the surrounding technology is, is what I see that can augment the humanity of healthcare industry, not to replace. We've heard of people talking about doctors being replaced and uh, nurses being replaced. Uh, as someone who spent 30 years as a patient family, I can tell you no one can replace them. The, the, the human to human care, human, um, intelligence and emotion is critically at the very heart of this industry but anything ai can do to enhance that is what i see as exciting and the the the, the opportunities are boundless i'm just super excited in, in, by this i completely share that with you and actually uh, let's generalize um, from that last part because it's not just not replacing nurses, not replacing doctors, but actually, in fact, 
you know, part of human-centered AI is to amplify the ability to work well, work meaningfully. Um, and, you know, one of the common misconceptions about AI is it's going to replace jobs uh, and people. Um, and, you know, look, there's going to be some jobs that will be made so much more efficient. There may be fewer people in them. But generally speaking, what we find a lot of what's going on is that AI can help collaborate with people and help uh, productivity. And we have, you know, uh, Eric Brynjolfsson uh, and his lab uh, at HAI is part of one of the things that, that you and and Etchemendi put a lot of energy into making happen. And and so, um, and I also know that you've been do, shifting some of your research to robotics um, because AI is obviously going to be central to robotics. Um, what do you see uh, happening with robotics in the business world? And what do you see about that and kind of uh, human work? Yeah, well, Reid, this is something that we, we uh, talked a lot. So, so first of all, um, it's healthcare is my application area, but my uh, my foundational research now is more in robotics. Let me just say to you that I'm so excited intellectually by robotics because that is the closing the loop of nature that a living, moving, interactive organism um, through the course of hundreds of millions of years of evolution to lead to an organism, an organism like human is, is nature showing us that uh, intelligence and action come together to brew together this incredible machinery. And, and robotics research is a vehicle to that. You, you suddenly have um, a system that can perceive, can learn, and can, can do. And that is um, the future of AI. Um, so, so whatever revolution we've seen in the past 10 years, read, I think it's a prelude of what, uh, what, what's to come, what's more exciting to come. And, and in that sense, I, 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 I'm definitely uh, have shifted from, from passive visual intelligence in computer vision to the more active robotic uh, perceptual robots uh, research. But that also has a profound um, um, impact in industry. In fact, you know, I mean, obviously manufacturing, but there is, you know, um, fulfillment, agriculture, um, everywhere humans uh, uh, are conducting, you know, a lot of physical labor, robotics is, um, is potentially an area that can become an assistive technology. Um, and uh, in fact, to start with, I actually do believe there's certain type of work that needs to be, re humans need to be replaced by machines, especially uh, the work that puts humans uh, in danger, whether it's deep water um, exploration or uh, a lot of rescue situations or, you know, um, other, you know, dangerous work. Um, but you and I um, have talked about it. Our friends at McKinsey have, have told us repeatedly, it, it's the tasks that might be replaced and assisted, not, not necessarily the jobs. Almost every human job is consisted of multidimensional tasks, many, many different kinds of tasks. There are tasks that are uh, difficult for humans, are dangerous for humans. And I can see robotics, you know, play a huge role. But there are tasks that are more reserved to human cognition, human in, 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 in emotion, hu, you know, and, and there I, I just don't see that. And it's, especially if as a society, we make sure, um, you know, how to, how to, you know, address these issues. So um, the future of work in the age of AI is a profound um, question. It in inevitably will impact workers, but the collective uh, uh, efforts in, uh, in, in how we train the future workers, how we mitigate uh, skill set uh, shifts, how we address, um, uh, you know, job landscape evolution, uh, together with how we use technology in a smart and humane way. Um, I'm hopeful that humanity having gone through 
several rounds of industrial um, industrialization and uh, labor shifts that we can address this together, but we have to be mindful of how we do that. So, so there, um, I've noticed the time, so we're going to quickly hit on two last you know, important questions, uh, just because you know, it wouldn't be complete without doing them. Um, the first is that there are a lot of countries uh, that are engaging in AI, and you were recently appointed by the White House uh, to the National Artificial Intelligence Research uh, Resource Task Force. Um, the, this task force launched due to efforts HAI led to call for a national research cloud, super important, which resulted in legislation passed in January to create the task force and make recommendations. Awesome. Um, so what role does HAI uh, make in, in making America more competitive in AI? And then um, how are you helping uh, the government and, uh, and the government as it interfaces industry understand the risk rewards for the future uh, for AI? Yeah, important question, Reid. Uh, first of all, as we discussed earlier, that America has been very unique. We have um, the world's healthiest, most vibrant ecosystem for the past more than half a century, close to a, closer to a century in terms of innovation. And our innovation goes as upstream as basic science technology all the way to the practice and the, the industrialization, commercialization um, of, of our technology. And that ecosystem brought this very prosperous um, you know, uh, society for us. Of course, it's an imperfect society. We have a lot of issues to address uh, from you know, the, 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 the way we, we look at how different groups of people are treated and, and many um, imperfections. But it's a society that's rooted in the belief of democracy, the belief of human rights and human values, the belief of uh, equality and justice. And I think that combination of such a healthy, vibrant, uh, innovative science and technology ecosystem plus the, the, the country's value is really important to all of us. And, and so is it important to HAI. So to start with, we hope to be a player and to contribute to that ecosystem. You know, academia is where some of the most innovative science and technology happen, including deep learning first happened in academia. So we want to continue to contribute that. But we also want to continue to uh, support policymakers to, to support America's uh, ecosystem. This is why we, we participated in the legislation. This is why I'm personally honored to be part of that um, effort. Um, so needless to say, we see ourselves as a player, we stand by to help our nation and to, um, you know, rise to the occasion whenever uh, that's needed. And most importantly, we educate our nation's future and we will continue to do that. Yeah. And speaking for many, many of us in industry, Nermals, thank you for your public service on this. It, it's really important on the nation. And as part of you just spoke so eloquently about about um, America, the idea, its values, its aspirations. Um, so I think it, it's fitting that this will get to our, I think our last question, which is um, increasing diversity in AI. Um, and uh, because part of the thing about the future that we wanna build to is to make sure it's inclusive for all of us. Um, and you know, one of the things that you, uh, uh, founded and 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 put a lot of, in addition to public service, a lot of personal energy and time for is AI for all. So if you could if you could um, say a little bit about that, and then also how people can help with it. Yeah, thank you, Reed. So so talking about America, one of the most beautiful thing about America is we're a nation of all people, people of all backgrounds, people of all race, people of all walks of life. But it's also a reality, not um, in today's world in our country. Um, for example, in the AI world, it's not well represented. You know, we're lacking women, we're lacking people of color, we're lacking people of all, all, all walks of life. And I realized this, um, it became really front and center to me as the deep learning revolution was taking off around 2014. And
recognize this really important question is that if we know and believe AI will change the world, change our future, the key question is really who will change AI? Who would be at the steering wheel of designing, developing, and deploying AI? Once we ask that question, we realize we knew the answer. We don't know how to reach the answer yet. Oh, we have a long way to reach the answer yet. The answer is we want the representation of the world, of America, to, 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 to be at the steering wheel of AI. That means we want to invite a lot more students from um, underrepresented, underserved uh, background um, the, who were not traditionally part of this technology to be trained as tomorrow's leader. And that was the birth of the national nonprofit AI for All, focusing on K-12 uh, education of AI. And uh, we, we serve high school students who will come to um, um, different uh, uh, chapters of AI for All across the nation, around 20 of them, but still uh, increasing to learn about AI in our summer programs. We partner with local universities and colleges so that the education to these students are, are, are um, uh, uh, you know, tailored towards the community needs. We also um, have online program to encourage both uh, teachers, K-12 teachers and students to participate in, uh, uh, in, in understanding AI. And we also have a couple of uh, programs uh, geared towards our alumni throughout their college years and early career to mentor them into the workforce of AI and uh, want to make sure they become tomorrow's AI leaders. So AI for All is a growing national nonprofit organization. We definitely encourage, uh, we partner with uh, companies, we partner with uh, mentors who believe in this mission, and we of course partner with uh, supporters who, who believe in our mission, and we would love to uh, work with any of you uh, out there who, who would believe in us and, and help us. So, Fei Fei, uh, an honor and a pleasure. We got to only about half of the questions and I think it's really important that the industry hear, hears from you, but that's kind of classic. Um, and so thank you so much. Um, you know, as always, uh, I learn, I'm certain everyone uh, here with us did as well. Um, and then thanks for everyone who joined us. Um, please keep an eye out for the next iConversation event. You can hear all these conversations on the Greylock podcast, Gray Matter. Uh, last but not least, if you'd like to share your thoughts on this event, you can fill out the survey. We will send you tomorrow. Uh, thanks again for joining us. And Fei Fei, as always, uh, an honor, a pleasure, a delight. Thank you. Of course, the, the feeling is mutual. Thank you, Reed. Always great to have a conversation with you. Yeah. Have a great day, everybody.